afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is keeping healthy and safe. Uh, first, I wish to express my thanks to the Singapore Chinese Chamber of Commerce and Industry for this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you for joining today's session. Um, as Kerry had mentioned, I lead the IP Tech Practice Group at Baker McKenzie Singapore. And today I hope to offer some tips on prevent, preventing and responding to breach of confidence. At the end of my session, it will hopefully allow you to assess whether you are ready should a breach occur at your company. Before we begin, a few housekeeping notes. Um, the session, I believe, is being recorded and you should have received a copy of uh, my slides for today's webinar. Uh, this is the agenda. I hope to complete the presentation in about 45 minutes and leave some time for Q&A. We're encouraging everyone to submit your questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please indicate your name with your question so that we can reach out to you separately after the session in case I'm unable to cover your question live. Uh, next slide, please. We will start with some background to offer context to our topic today. Why is confidential information at risk? Most, if not all of you, should be familiar with what confidential information is and its importance to your business. First, what is confidential information? At its core, confidential information is information that is disclosed in private or secret with mutual trust between the two parties, the discloser and the recipient. The failure to protect confidential information may not only lead to the loss of your business or your clients, it may also cause the information to be released to the public. Now, once that happens, the once confidential information may forever lose its quality of confidence. However, protecting confidential information has become harder in today's world. Advances in modern technology has made it much easier for people to access, copy and disseminate vast amounts of confidential information. What used to require hours to physically copy can now be done in seconds, stored on a cloud and retransmitted. As more companies adopt work from home arrangements, employees may find it easier to access and steal confidential information while avoiding uh, detection. There are other threats to cybersecurity, which I shall explain in further detail. First, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has brought along with it threats to cybersecurity. And we featured some examples here in this slide. Criminals are now taking the opportunity to disrupt the businesses or to profit from stealing confidential information. In addition, cybersecurity attacks such as ransomware, fraud, scams, uh, what we call phishing, spelled with a PH, uh, they have been growing uh, at an alarming pace. Second, next slide, please. Second, companies are permitting or even requiring employees to work remotely. This decision, which is calculated to minimize risk of contracting COVID-19, has increased the risk of misuse of trade secrets. And in this remote work environment, employees have more opportunities to access, download, or store sensitive information from company systems and databases. Think about your home printers, cell phones, your tablets that are being used by the employees. Some of them are even working in public places such as libraries or cafes. Companies may also relax otherwise stringent document management rules or allow for workarounds from their usual security measures in the interest of efficiency. And in this kind of environment, employees may naturally assume that they have wider latitude from employers to email, copy, send, print, or download information. Next slide. These developments have led 
to an increase in the number of breach of confidence disputes. And in 2020, April last year, our Court of Appeal, recognizing this ease of uh, theft of confidential information that comes with the advance in modern technology, they set out a modified approach to deciding breach of confidence. And this was in the case of I admin versus Hong Wing Ting. Next slide. Today, I'll be talking about the latest developments set out by this new iAdmin case, its implications on uh, future breach of confidence claims and what it means to you. Thereafter, I hope to offer some practical tips to guard against potential breach of confidence and to respond uh, to such incidents. So we turn now to the case. The appellant in this case, I admin Singapore Private Limited, uh, was a company that was in the business of payroll administrative data processing services and human resource information systems. Two of the company's ex employees, Hong and Liu, were unhappy with I admin's payroll software. They felt that it was flawed, it was inadequate. And so they embarked on a personal venture to develop their own personal, sorry, their own software to address what they felt were the shortcomings. They subsequently left iAdmin and they incorporated their own company called Nice Payroll Private Limited. Around four years after Hong and Liu's departure, iAdmin came across Nice Payroll's website and found that the payroll and uh, HR system substantially overlapped with the geographical scope of its own services. I admin then sued Nice Payroll in uh, the Singapore High Court, and they obtained what we term as a search and seizure order. So this allows the appellants to go into Nice Payroll's premises and search the premises. And when they did that, they found confidential information belonging to I admin including iAdmin's source codes, their client materials, their software and hardware and technical platforms. iAdmin's case was for, amongst other things, breach of confidence uh, and copyright infringement. And iAdmin alleged that the two ex-employees had conspired to start a competing payroll business. They had access and downloaded iAdmin's confidential information when they were still employed. And these two former employees then went on to use the material in the course of developing nice payrolls businesses. Now, the Singapore High Court, which is the court of first instance, they dismiss uh, the breach of confidence claim because they concluded that there was no unauthorized use of iAdmin's confidential information. This was overturned on appeal um, by the Singapore Court of Appeal. We now discuss the Court of Appeal's ruling on when a breach of confidence claim occurs. Next slide. Given the limited time for today's webinar, uh, I will go directly to stating the Court of Appeal's reformulated test for breach of confidence. The court said to succeed in a breach of confidence claim, the claimant or the plaintiff must prove three things. Number one, the information must have the quality of confidence. So what does this mean? This depends on a variety of factors, such as whether the information is available to the public at large, whether releasing this kind of information could injure the owner of the information or benefit third parties, and whether the owner believes uh, the information to be secret. Number two, they must prove that the information is imparted in circumstances importing an obligation of confidence. Now, this can be found either from your uh, express contractual provision, right, such as uh, particular clauses found in the employment contract, or it could be implied from law. And then the third element that the claimant must prove after the first two elements are satisfied. Uh, the court said, once that is done, a breach of confidence is then presumed. The defendant must then prove that 
his conscience was not affected, for example, by showing that he came across the information by accident uh, or that he was unaware of its confidential nature or the defendant believed that there was a very strong public interest in uh, disclosing the confidential information. Now, under the old framework, uh, before this court of appeal decision, the previous third element was that the defendant must prove, sorry, the plaintiff must prove that it had made unauthorized use of the information to the detriment of the party from whom the, the information originated. So you, you can imagine how problematic this can be as it is frequently very hard to show evidence of unauthorized use. And these difficulties are made worse in today's remote working environment as tracking or monitoring tools may not be installed on home networks uh, or on your employees' personal devices. It is also hard to prove detriment as it is difficult to quantify. Sometimes there may be no quantifiable loss at all. So this new approach shifts the burden of proof to the defendant after the first two elements are satisfied. This reformulated test is therefore uh, more favorable to the owners of confidential information or the employers. Ultimately, in the IMN case, the Court of Appeal found that there was no dispute that the two ex-employees possess and circulated IMN's confidential information. In addition, the Court of Appeal found that the defendants failed to prove that their conscience was not affected. So the Court of Appeal overturned the High Court's decision and found for the claimant. So what are the remedies you can seek for uh, from uh, uh, as, a, as a plaintiff. So the appropriate remedies for breach of confidence cases are first, damages arising from the breach of confidence or alternatively, you can ask for an account of the defendant's profits. Uh, number two, you can seek what we call other equitable reliefs uh, and this include applying for uh, an interlocutory or final injunction to stop the defendants from using uh, the confidential information. You can apply for uh, search and seizure orders, and you can also apply for delivery up orders, uh, such as the return of confidential information. Now, the court has also directed in the IMN case that equitable damages uh, may be granted where this refers to the amount of time and money that the defendants save as a result of taking the plaintiff's confidential information. And this could be calculated as the value of the confidential information. Since I admin, mean, there have been two reported cases where employers rely on this new test set out in I admin. Uh, and they did so for an interlocutory application against their employees. Uh, when I say interlocutory application, it means you know before the actual trial is heard, because you know you need to move very quickly and urgently. So even before the actual trial itself, you would have gone to the court and uh, applied for uh, an injunction to restrain the defendant from misusing the confidential information. In one case, the employers were partially successful. Uh, so they were awarded some of the interlocutory injunctions they applied for. In the other case, the employer was successful in obtaining the interlocutory injunction. In fact, we acted for the employer in this second case uh, where we uh, successfully obtained the interlocutory injunction. And this application uh, was uh, in for breach of uh, confidence case against former employees. And the main challenge we had in our case was that the defendant did not have any evidence that there had been unauthorized use of confidential information. But with this new framework set up in IMN, it fell upon the defendants to rebut the, uh, rebut the presumption by showing that their conscience was unaffected and ultimately they failed to do so. And hence the court granted the interlocutory injunction. Next slide. 
So let me turn now to some practical tips on what you can do to ensure that your information possesses the quality of confidence uh, and is imparted in circumstances importing an obligation of confidence. So the first two elements. Now, as you may recall, um, a requirement of confidentiality is for the information to possess the quality of confidence. And here, the key is to ensure that your information is not something which is public property or public knowledge. Where the information in question is similar to something already in the public domain, the court will then consider whether someone applied some skill and ingenuity in the treatment of the information to make it worthy of protection. For example, is the information developed through years of R&D uh, or commercially valuable to your company? Some common types of information uh, found in past cases, uh, what we call case laws, they are found to be confidential and they will include things like your customer list, your client data, uh, your business plans, your business strategies, if you have any kind of material recipes and manufacturing formulas. So past cases have found these categories of information uh, to be confidential. So it is crucial for you to define uh, what confidential information is in your contract or in your employment handbook. I've come across agreements where the confidentiality clause uh, in contracts, they do not particularize what the parties uh, uh, purportedly agree to be confidential. The courts won't help you imply what is considered to be confidential. So I recommend that your confidentiality clauses reference and feature items of confidence, perhaps in an annex uh, to the agreement to allow for easy updates and have employees countersign these updates uh, at the annex regularly. Additionally, take the effort to mark or stamp as confidential or secret uh, various corporate documents or data which you consider to be confidential. Uh, next slide. The second element of the test for breach of confidence is to prove that the information was imparted in circumstances importing an obligation of confidence. Quite a mouthful, I know. So how do you do this? Employers should look to increasing awareness uh, of the uh, employees or recipient of the confidentiality of their documents. Here, you can consider preparing a clear corporate confidentiality policy and have them featured in your employment or your contractor agreements, in your employment handbooks or your corporate intranet website. You should also consider conducting and keeping records of regular trainings with employees on these policies and teaching them how to uh, 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 create uh, and to recognize confidential information. Additionally, remind employees of these policies, for instance, through automated newsletter reminders and introduce periodic audits to refresh and update your company's confidentiality policies so as to keep up with uh, technological changes and practical usage of the information. Next slide. You should also introduce technical measures to restrict misuse. For instance, prohibit USB access to work laptops or ban access to file sharing websites unless the employee requests for an exception in writing to you. Have your IT department or HR monitor downloads and file transfers um, by any of the employees using endpoint monitoring tools. You can also introduce governance policies uh, in relation to use of personal electronic devices and use of social media. And most importantly, document these measures introduced. 
as your lawyers, they will need uh, ammunition to go to court. They will require what we lawyers call an evidential documentary trail, right? So we need this kind of documentary evidence of the uh, efforts that are made by the uh, uh, trade secret or confidential information owner. Uh, next slide. Now, if there's one thing that the I admin case and the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has taught us, however, it's that the measures that are required to protect confidential information will change according to commercial realities, such as technological developments and working arrangements. And with organizations around the world undergoing this shift on a accelerated timeline towards teleworking or remote working for some or all of your employees, they now uh, have to contend with ensuring that the networks or their VPNs or other IT resources are able to support such a shift. All organizations should take steps to mitigate the potential threats uh, to the security of their confidential information that comes with this shift. And here are some questions that you can ask yourself about whether you have done enough to prepare uh, and respond to a breach of confidence. Um, I'll just give you a moment to look at the questions that we have set out on this slide. Now, the number of questions on this slide and the next may seem quite daunting, but they can be grouped into uh, four main areas. First, measures to regulate access to restricted systems. Now, while traditional work arrangements made it feasible to subject systems to uh, on-premises uh, access only, now you have the shift to teleworking and it may require systems to be opened up for remote access. Employers must Therefore, consider new and additional security features to ensure that your system's integrity is retained, uh, perhaps such as uh, adopting a two-factor authentication. So maybe a password itself is not enough. You may need something to receive an OTP. Second, consider what type of devices are being uh, used for remote working. Are your employees working using uh, company-issued devices? If so, are these devices new and have up-to-date security software? Prior generation or stored devices may no longer uh, be supported or have gaps in their software security patches. If your employees do not have company-issued device, you could permit them to use uh, personal devices but this brings us back to the original problem. You will have little control over the security of devices personally owned by your employees. You may then have to consider whether arrangements are appropriate to ensure that they are secure. Next slide. So these are uh, some, some additional uh, questions for uh, you know, your checklist. I'll just pause here for a moment for you to have a look. Now, employers also need to consider potential breaches of confidence from external sources. Given the trend of recent uh, cyber attacks in Singapore, which have been targeting sectors such as healthcare and the growing sophistication of uh, phishing attacks, combined with the possibility of uh, increased remote connections due to employees working in public spaces, Employers should also consider preparing their systems and workforce on how to address and mitigate these risks in the remote working context. And then finally, data privacy. Consider if you have properly issued a privacy notice or obtain consent, whether a data protection impact assessment is needed for the monitoring activities, uh, whether a cross-border transfer solution is needed for your company and whether appropriate terms are in place with uh, any vendors or third parties who 
who may access the data. Employment related considerations uh, would include whether employees uh, or their representatives should be consulted on the monitoring activity, whether any data collections could be used at a later time as basis uh, for discrimination or unfair treatment claims against your company. Uh, next slide. Now, at times, however, all these preventive measures I've suggested on their own, they may not be enough to prevent a breach of confidential information from taking place. In the event that you do discover such a breach, um, how should you respond? So first, gather all your evidence as soon as possible. This may include computer logs, access times and dates, IP addresses, and so on. You may want to engage external forensic experts to secure evidence if required. Uh, such digital forensic experts are likely to possess skills that conventional IT professionals may not have, uh, namely a deeper and broader understanding of IT infrastructure, operating systems, and applications. They may also likely, um, these forensic experts are also likely to have experience working and coordinating work with uh, legal compliance and your HR teams. Quite frequently, we see that companies, when they uh, are alerted to their, let's say, employees uh, misappropriating confidential information, their knee-jerk reaction is to approach them and, and you know, try to interrogate them. Did you take this? Did you, did you take that? And without procuring those evidence first, you know, this is usually a, a, a fatal move because what you need to do first is to collect gather all of the incriminating evidence before you confront the employee. Once you confront the employee, you know, he will systematically, he or she will systematically um, delete and clear the evidential trail and then you will have next to nothing to rely on. Now, after you have gathered the evidence, you know, appoint your legal counsel who will most likely work with you to consider the various available options of, uh, uh, based on your budget and the goals for your enforcement. Uh, so let's look at some uh, practical tips on the questions you may encounter when, uh, when working with your legal counsel. First, you should ask yourself what you wish to achieve by pursuing an action for breach of confidence taking into account the specific circumstances of your case. And this will in turn determine the best options uh, to remedy the breach. For example, do you want to make sure the defendant delivers your information or materials back? Or are you happy with an assurance that the defendant no longer has access to the confidential uh, information in question? What happens if you cannot prove actual use uh, by the defendant, but suspect that the defendant may engage in wrongdoing in the near future? Do you wish to gather evidence by way of a search order? Or do you prefer to pursue an order compelling the defendant to seize their course of conduct? Perhaps you are pursuing this action to send a message to other employees in the company. But how do you wish to do so? Do you want to uh, take the uh, uh, employees who have misappropriated the confidential information to court? Do you want to send them to jail and invoke criminal uh, uh, prosecution? Or do you want to avoid the publicity by addressing the breach of confidence through internal processes? Next slide. So this brings me nicely to a broader question. Is a breach of confidence the only way for companies to protect their confidential information? And the short answer is no. There are a variety of other causes of action that you should consider, uh, such as the breach of the employment contract uh, or breach of duty of 
fidelity, assuming the um, you know employee has certain duties of fidelity, such as a director. Uh, you can consider civil copyright infringement claims where there is copying involved of, uh, let's say, some drawings or some uh, literary works, right? Some manuals. You can consider, as I mentioned earlier, criminal actions. A breach of confidence claim will almost always result in a breach of the Singapore Copyright Act and the Computer Misuse Act. And if there has been a suspected breach, um, you can also consider filing a police report. And this may put additional pressure on the perpetrators. You may also consider filing a private prosecution, okay, instead of a public, uh, lodging a complaint to trigger a public prosecution. Now, the actions I described uh, involves litigation. Uh, or some kind of court proceedings. And this may not always be the most suitable way forward due to costs and time associated with bringing these kind of claims. And sometimes breach of confidence can be solved without going to court. For example, one of our clients encountered an employee who had transferred uh, huge amounts of content out of his corporate device. But they managed to resolve this dispute out of court by negotiating an agreement where the employee allowed the client to check through his files and delete them. However, once you are of the view that litigation is inevitable, the need to contact lawyers and your external forensics and investigations team becomes paramount uh, as these parties will play a crucial role in helping you collect the evidence that's required for a trial. We face an issue where one of our clients uh, who was uh, initially unwilling to hire a forensics team due to costs. Um, and by the commencement of the trial, they began facing significant challenges, putting their evidence together because by that stage, uh, many of their uh, folks in, in the affected company had already resigned and left the company. Now, given the lengthy period of time that may be required in litigation proceedings, you should also begin to consider applying for search and seizure orders or interim injunctions uh, to gather incriminating evidence and to stop the defendants from carrying out uh, further damaging behavior. Of course, as employers, you may also find yourselves as defendants to a breach of confidence action because you have hired possibly a new employee who has himself misappropriated confidential information belonging to his ex-employer. This is a real risk. Ex-employees, especially those in sales, may bring across their ex-employer's confidential information without your knowledge. Uh, examples would be client contacts or pricing information. Um, and they do so without your awareness and in the belief that this is going to help them in their new jobs. And ex-employers consequently can bring a variety of action, uh, legal action against you, such as uh, court of inducement of uh, breach of contract. If the new employer had anything to do with the ex-employee's breach of contract, they can also bring uh, action against the new employer as what we call a joint court teaser uh, with the uh, ex-employee for breach of confidence or, or copyright infringement. Or they can bring uh, proceedings for uh, unlawful means conspiracy. Right? So your company's policies and handbooks become all the more important uh, as they can build a paper trail showing that you had nothing to do with the new employee's breach of contract or breach of confidence. And in a breach of confidence claim, these policies or handbook may also go towards rebutting the presumption. That's the third test, remember? They can, may, they can go towards rebutting the presumption of, of, uh, of guilt by showing that your conscience was clear. So a few recommendations for how your policies and handbooks can achieve this. 
you can, for instance, have your new employee sign disclaimers or indemnity forms if they claim uh, or actually uh, does bring across information uh, that could be considered confidential information such as client contacts. You may also wish to expressly state in your company handbook that you do not condone such actions. All right. Um, so that takes me. Uh, next slide, please. That takes me to uh, the end of my presentation. Uh, as promised, I've taken about forty to forty-five minutes, and I will now open uh, the floor uh, to questions. Thank you, Andy, for the informative presentation. So before we start the Q&A, if you would like to receive the presentation deck, please take some time to fill up the feedback form at the end of the session. The presentation deck will be sent to you a few days later. Let us now welcome Andy back for the Q&A. So if you have any questions for him, please submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. As you have limited time, we may not be able to answer all questions. So if your question is not answered, Please contact Baker Mackenzie Wong and Wong directly with their contact details on the screen now or email s ci and we will forward your queries to them. Okay, so let me get the ball rolling with the question that we received from participants before the webinar. So uh, we have one from CR Asia. So uh, assuming that the confidentiality clause has been signed and enforced, will this clause be valid even after the employee has left the organization? Um. Well, it really turns uh, carry on um, the provision, all right? So if the um, contractual term actually provides all right, for uh, the preservation of the confidential information, even post termination of, let's say, the employee's contract, then of course, you will be able to enforce the contract. Now, Many people think that you can only sue for uh, breach of confidence if there's a contract. That's not the case. Okay, uh, so obviously the case will be, I suspect, stronger if you have a contract in place. But do remember the breach of confidence um, actually stems from what we call principles of equity. Of fairness. So, in the same way, if let's say Carrie um, provides to me some confidential information by way of a contract, it says that Andy, you you have to protect this and you're not supposed to disclose this information. And I then um, provide it mischievously to Party A. Now, even though Party A has got no contractual obligation with either Kerry or with myself. If party A had received such information, knowing that it was disclosed on the basis of mutual trust, that, that Kerry had passed the information to me on the basis of mutual trust, then party A uh, could be liable for breach of confidence. I, I hope that answers the first question. Okay, so I have another one from Aviation Virtual. So most of us have actually signed the non-disclosure agreement, which is an NDA during our employment, right? So, but how actually uh, legally enforceable and effective are NDAs? Well, you know, if the provisions in the NDA are in line with Singapore law and, you know, they don't, uh, uh, come up with certain provisions which render the NDA either void or unenforceable, then the NDA will be enforceable. It's like any other contract. I see. Yeah. So what I meant by rendering it um, void or unenforceable, sometimes, you know, they may introduce uh, in the NDA what we call penalty clauses. So that's a no-no. You can't, you know, uh, introduce penalty clauses. Penalty clauses are, are uh, not permissible, right, over in Singapore. Uh, so if you do that, then you may render the NDA void. Thank you, Andy. 
So, uh, okay, now questions are coming in in the Q&A box. I have one from um, Mr. Lim. Is there a standard guidebook to help employers protect confidentiality informa confidential information in all aspects to avoid future problems? I don't think that there is, um, you know, some kind of a silver bullet mm. guidebook. Um, but I think our slide here is, is going to function as a good starting point. There are quite a lot of textbooks on, um, you know, the, the, the law of confidence. Um, but, you know, they will probably put you to sleep <laughs> reading that. Uh, the easier way, of course, is point um, either your in-house counsel or your external lawyers, right, to help you design some kind of corporate policy. Uh, and, you know, that will be a short guide that will manage the expectations of both employers and employees uh, where it deals with confidential information. Well, I have one from Tina. Uh, it follows up for the previous question. So she's asking if there is no penalty clause, then how can we define the NDA? Um, when a breach, let's say if you disclose the information to the recipient and the, if the recipient breaches the NDA, uh, what you will do is that you will conceivably sue him right, in the court and you will claim for what I had earlier mentioned uh, as damages. And it is for the court to decide uh, how much that damages is going to be. Uh, when I say penalty clause, um, you know, you may sometimes read in an agreement and they will say that, you know, if uh, you breach this agreement, um, you will be expected to pay 10 times the value of this information, which we quantify as X. So when you do that, that is called a penalty clause. It's meant to punish. Uh, that is uh, illegal. Okay, Andy. So uh, another one from an anonymous attendee. Can you elaborate more on private prosecution? Okay. Um, when you speak about prosecution, it is an offense against the state. It is different from civil litigation. In civil litigation, you have two parties, civil parties, and party A has suffered a loss, right? And you are taking proceedings, you are litigating the matter in court to force party B to pay you your damages or to stop party B from doing something or to force party B to do something which he has promised to do, for instance, in his contract. But for prosecution, it is an offense against the state. And um, usually, it will be a situation where the state will be expecting to meet out if it succeeds in convicting the, the accused, it will be expecting the court to meet out a fine and the fine, the monies will be paid to the state, not to you, uh, or there may be uh, custodial sentences like a jail term. So when you have a private prosecution, instead of this matter being prosecuted by the attorney general's chambers right, uh, and the deputy public prosecutors or DPP, sometimes you will hear, right, these are the officers in the attorney general's chambers who will be responsible for the prosecution. So in these instances, when you're looking at private prosecution, you may want to take the matters in your own, own hands. Okay, And there are certain offenses where you can invoke private prosecution, not all, certain offenses that you can, and then you will uh, hire your own lawyers uh, to prosecute. Thank you, Andy. Okay, I have one from CDAF. Um, he's asking, so this company has already signed an agreement with a vendor that they cannot touch the customer database, but how is there a way to totally prevent vendors from actually using it? Um, I think I've already mentioned on the practical tips, the steps that you, you can take, right? So if he has um, already 
provided contractual promises that he's not going to use. And despite that, he has used. There are a few things you can do. I mean, gather your evidence first, as I've mentioned, right? And once you've secured the evidence, some of the, the options that you have would be, for instance, to get your lawyers to send him a demand letter, to get him to stop and to get him to pay you what you say are your losses, assuming you are able to uh, assess those losses, right? If he refuses to do that, then you know you can commence uh, litigation proceedings against the party that has breached the NDA, and then you can apply for a court interlocutory injunction. Okay, at the start before the the full trial. Um, you know, and once you have completed with the trial, you know, you, you will get a final injunction to stop him from using the confidential information. You can get a delivery up order to force him to return, you know, the confidential information to you. Uh, and of course, you can claim for, as I said, either damages or an account of profits. I do hope that answers your question. Okay, um, okay the attendee who posted the question on private prosecution has uh, answered another question. Uh, thank you for the answer. So how, how, do you go, how do we go about private prosecution with our lawyers then? Um, I've not come across a situation where a party has um, invoked private prosecution without lawyers. It, it, is, it is not easy, um, I, I have to confess. Um, I, I do not recommend it. Um, I, uh, the short answer is I, I don't think you should go about applying for private prosecution without lawyers. You, you need to file a complaint first and then, you know, depending on the nature of the offense, you, you may have to see whether you will require to obtain a fiat from the Attorney General's chambers and then thereafter you have to frame charges. You know, so it's, it's not... Uh, that simple. Okay, sounds complicated. <laughs> okay, I have an attendee uh, who's asking, nowadays it's very common for staff to possess a business partner's contact in their personal mobile phones. So, and such data will stay with them even if they leave the company. So are they subjected to a breach of data in this scenario? So if yes, what kind of actions can a company take? Okay, so this, obviously depends on um, a lot of factors, right? So whether they are using their own personal devices or are they using company issued devices? If they are using their own personal devices, do you um, permit your employees as a matter of company policy to use personal devices? I mean, if you do and you encourage them, you know, to use their devices for work, Right, so that they can receive calls outside of business hours. Um, it will be quite difficult for you to then say that they have uh, breached anything. So remember the earlier slides where I had mentioned that you should come up with some policies. Right? So social use of social media is one such policy. Use of devices is another such policy. So as a company, um, you should discuss with your in-house counsel or your external counsel um, exactly what are the parameters. Are you going to permit them to, to do so? Uh, if you don't permit them to do so, then of course, you know, in, it, these things can be featured either on things like the company's handbook or, you know, the, the corporate policies that you may feature on the employee intranet, the office intranet or you may even just send up, put up notices in the office or, or send newsletters to your employees. And, and that you know, uh, will constitute uh, some kind of terms, employment terms between yourself and your employee, or at least an understanding. Yeah, there are various methods, you know, so things like trainings. If you were to organize these trainings and they after attending the trainings, you know, you get them to sign, they, they acknowledge that they've received the, the training. It will be hard for them to subsequently argue with you and say that, well, you know, you permitted me to use my personal device for purposes of work. So um, uh, it, it, 
will be it will be a bit mischievous of you now to turn around and say that I can't use you know, such information. Yeah. Okay, so now let me bring uh, the angle overseas a bit. So more companies, especially now with the COVID situation, um, more companies are hiring employees and vendors overseas and confidential data is being shared with them as well. So in the events of a data leak, is the local employer able to take legal action against them? Um, in terms of the, the uh, breach of confidence claim, well, sorry, let me back up. Um, if, if they are confidential information uh, and they have taken this confidential information, the fact that they are working remotely, um, to me, doesn't stop the company from bringing an action. Right. So let's say if you have uh, an employee and you decide to second him to a subsidiary that you have over in Hong Kong and you know, he works there for six months and while he's there, he's misusing the information. That doesn't stop you. Remember, I go back to my earlier point as well. So quite apart from the fact that there is in existence an employment contract, you know, if the information has been imparted under the obligations, you know, which under circumstances which import a duty of confidence, then uh, you will have a claim for breach of confidence. Remember the, the, the test, right? There are three things. Number one, does the information, first of all, have the quality of confidence? Okay. Is, is it something that the court will consider it to be confidential information? The second thing is, you know, was the information imparted under uh, circumstances where you will import an obligation of confidence? And then third, okay, once the first two are satisfied, the third is the, the burden then shifts to the defendant and then the defend the court will ask the defendant to explain, you know, is his conscience clear? So use those three tests um, in, in the scenario that you are thinking about. So the fact that the employee is, you know, now working remotely um, doesn't change those three tests. So it applies across the board, yeah? yeah. I understand. Okay, so um, I'm just curious. So now that we have so much information being sent across to departments and different companies, so what is the right amount of protection that we can put in to protect the data? I think you've mentioned practical tips and uh, steps that we can take. So is there such a thing called doing too much to protect the data? Um, pardon, Kerry, can, can you repeat that again? Okay, uh, so we have a lot of information uh, traveling between departments and companies and you have shared with many practical tips on how to protect the data so is there um how do we know how do we put the right amount of resources into protecting the information is there such a thing as doing too much to protect it um if you were to adopt again the practical tips that we have outlined in the slides i think that will give you a very good and comfortable starting point okay, as to um, what you should do. Then on your second question of whether there's you know, a too much protection, I, I would suggest no. So, you know, as you are coming, as you are devising your policies for the company, you will probably have a good uh, instinctive test as to whether the things that you are imposing, is it too onerous? Right? Is it something which the employees will uh, rebel, right? So I think, you know, if, if these information, let's take a particular type of information like customers list, um, as I've said, you know, it's already been recognized by case laws that this is a genre of information that the courts will consider as confidential. And if you were to introduce all these measures, like no one is supposed to take the confidential information and put it inside their personal devices, I, I don't think it is unreasonable at all. They are information which, after all, belongs to the company. I have a question from Gerald Lin. 
um, because previously Andy, you have already defined uh, what is confidential information. So it's asking, what about know-hows? Ex-staff, they may claim that the ideas were knowledge learned through the years of employment. So and know-hows cannot, it's not possible to file patents against it. So how does it work here? Um, yes, I, I don't quite understand this concept of, I mean, what is defined by um, know-how. If it is information which the former staff has acquired in the course of his work, there is a line of cases that says that, you know, what is inside his head, he's permitted to retain. And, you know, that's just tough. Uh, but when you are looking at confidential information, it will be, you know, you're looking at usually things that are a bit more tangible, right? Like, let's say a formula for Kentucky Fried Chicken's secret recipe, or you are looking at a client list. But if, for instance, the client list, you know, let's say you're, you're working in an industry where there are very, very few clients, there are like 10 clients, and, and the former employee is able to memorize these 10 clients, then that's tough. Okay? And what you are really looking at is people who are copying, you know, copious amounts of uh, information uh, or, you know, uh, physically extracting this kind of information. The, the whole essence of confidential information is that it is not available out in the public domain. Um, so if you were to artificially restricted to five years, you have to be careful. What that means is that at the end of five years, if this person is permitted to use it, then that information will no longer be confidential to you. Okay, so in answer to your question, yes, it is very reasonable to say that the restriction uh, has a validity period for five years. But my question back to you is, you know, do you want to introduce that? So can you imagine if, let's say, Kentucky Fried KFC says, you know, I have this secret recipe, right? But I, if you, if you uh, have access to it, uh, I permit you to use it after five years. That, that can really destroy your business. Okay, now come to the last question from Bray. Uh, in, in the case where an employee Post resignation divulges confidential information that really results in losses in a company and practice. How would we be able to obtain such uh, evidence? Um, the first um, part of all I would suggest is you know the computer records. So if your IT department has um, image, you know, and has backed up. Uh, data trail, um, that is going to be very helpful. The second is, um, you know, in terms of the uh, disclosure of confidential information, if he has left and he has used this confidential information, you probably will need to get a good set of investigators. And some of these investigators are very enterprising you know, they may have a front company in a particular type of business and they may make an approach um, to your former employee's new company and, you know, they may ask. And there's where you um, may have sight of the uh, confidential information that they have taken. So investi investigative efforts are very critical. So both externally, you know, uh, by getting ex um, external investigators to have a look and internally by looking at some of your um, past data when the employee was still with you. And quite frequently as well, you know, you may have tip-offs from your customer. So your customer may say, you know, guess what, your, your former employee just recently approached me and, you know, showed me, you know, um, your, your, let's say, uh, levels of profits. And you know, he's telling me that 
and this new company receives less. So if if these tip-offs, the, the, the disclosure of these tip-offs, if he's prepared to furnish evidence to you and is willing to be a witness in court, then, uh, you will have such evidence. Okay, so before we end off, do you have any final piece of advice for our attendees, Andy? Um, <laughs> I think the most important piece of advice I, I, I would suggest to most of you is, you know, when these things happen in your company, please keep calm. Remember what I said earlier, do not react instinctively and just approach, you know, the employee or the former employee and just say, look, why did you do this to me? You know, it's so unfair. Um, it, it is not helpful. And we've seen many, many instances where the employers will do that. And straight away, you know, the, the, uh, the person who has breached the duties of confidence, they will begin to clean up the evidence. So keep the group small, okay? So if let's say it is accounts that have first detected this or you know your sales were first detected this keep this to a very small group uh, don't involve too many people in the office maybe just keep it to like four or five people max try and get your in-house counsel uh, involved if you don't have an in-house counsel get an external counsel involved they will usually teach you how to control the information All right then uh, from there, carry out your investigations, as I said, you know, if it is possible internally by, if, if your company has uh, backups of data, right, uh, or alternatively external investigators, get the evidence first. So those are, you know, I, I think that is probably the most helpful <laughs> Uh, tip I can I can give you the other stuff you know it's already featured in our slides. Thank you, Andy. So remember to be cautious and do not uh, confront the 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 culprit first before you get any evidence. Okay, so this is the final question. Hope that everyone now have a better understanding of how to prevent and respond to the misappropriation of confidential information. So thank you for your participation and a very big thank you to Andy for your time and valuable sharing today. We hope that you have benefited a lot from the webinar. So before we end, a gentle reminder to complete the feedback form by clicking the link that will appear at, after you leave the session. So we look forward to seeing you again in our future events. Stay safe and have a great long weekend. Thank you, Andy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.